Hello. I'm going to present you Skyrack, uh, one tool I've been written in order to generate ROP payload. So this is the second talk uh, related to, to return-oriented programming. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, I work in an IT company called Hervé Shower Consultants. Uh, we're about uh, 20, uh, 30 people. Uh, I perform mostly uh, any IT uh, security assessment, uh, mostly uh, highly technical. And uh, we have been one of the first uh, companies in France uh, performing a pen test. Uh, Myself, I'm Jean-Baptiste Avia, so uh, I mostly perform pen tests and technical edit for this company, and I've been in HSC for uh, three years. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little uh, the concept of the return-oriented programming for uh, those of you who don't do uh, daily uh, exploit uh, writing then we are going to see how we can construct a ROP payload in practice. Um, and I'm going to explain you what are our gadgets and why we need a tool to construct a ROP payload. Then I'm going to introduce you the basics of my tool, so Skyrack. And uh, we're going to see uh, in practice how we construct uh, a real payload. And then I'm going to show you a, a little demonstration of the generated exploit. Um, little parenthesis, there is um, a mistake on the, uh, when I sent uh, the name of my tool to, uh, to Sysdream. So for the French people, there is a little uh, play on word with uh, Skyrack. This is related to the name of a French radio. Uh, I'll let you think about it during the, the presentation and uh, I'll be able to explain it to you after. Okay, so what is ROP already? Um, so, the buffer overflow in ages began with free exploitation. Okay, we discovered the thing and there was no protection, so everything was uh, really good for an uh, exploit writer. Then comes some protection measures, such as the stack randomization. Okay, so we, we, we were not able to, to push some uh, static uh, offset in order to jump uh, to our payload. Um, so we use uh, of we use opcodes such as jump ESP to jump to the to the stack. Another bypass has been to use um, to mark the memory as only writable or only execu or only executable. Such uh, so this way attackers were not able to push shellcode on the stack and to jump to it and execute it. Um, and this has been bypassed by the return into libc um, method. And then the ISLR, uh, which allowed to randomize some uh, libraries and uh, some uh, programs in order to have a non-static address. So we could even use uh, such uh, opcodes in, uh, in libraries, since we don't know their, uh, their address. Uh, so the return-oriented programming, uh, the return into libc, it allows you to call external library uh, functions, even to chain calls, but it is uh, often difficult because in this way you can only push static arguments on the stack. You are not able to, to compute uh, dynamically your arguments, of course. So uh, the wrap allows you to uh, use arbitrary instruction to compute uh, exactly the argument of the function as you want. So this is a, a great advantage on a return into libc uh, call. So the thing you have to understand to get uh, the wrap is the ret instruction. Okay, this is a really simple instruction you can find at almost the end of any function in any program. Ret does pop EIP. Okay, EIP is uh, the pointer of uh, the instruction that are currently executed by your processor. And uh, if you do a write, it will take the top of your stack and push it into EIP. Okay, so write means that we take the first value on the stack, we remove it, we push it into EIP, and uh, we're good to go. Okay, so the address on your stack will be executed uh, after uh, if you if you run a write. 
instruction. So before we smash EIP, uh, usually we have ESP pointing somewhere. We have just below the saved EIP, and uh, correctly, EIP is uh, pointing to a vulnerable function and the right. Okay, so that is just before we gain execution. Next step, the write is executed. As I said previously, the top of the stack of the stack is gone into EIP. And uh, if, uh, like it was the case, EIP uh, was is now pointing to an instruction which is followed by a write, you can see that the next instruction executed will indeed uh, be the write. And so, same schema as before the address in the top of the stack will go into EIP, okay? So, indeed. This way, by writing such a, such address on the stack, uh, if uh, all the address point to instruction followed by your write, we will be able to execute many, uh, as many instructions as we want, or more preciously, as many instructions as we have room for on the stack, okay? So the second gadget returns, and uh, here the second gadget has returned, so uh, after we don't know where we go. Okay, so what is the goal of a rope payload? If you use only a return into libc, uh, typically we, we, you will uh, execute things such as uh, running a shell or uh, adding a user, but with uh, return-oriented programming, you can perform most more and more things, uh, such as uh, pushing arbitrary shell code on the stack. Uh, so how do we do that? We prepare the execution of a traditional payload. So we allocate some, execu some uh, executable memory, or we disable annex, or we grant executable permission to some memory mapping. We can resolve address. There is many things that can be done. Uh, then we copy or we jump to the payload. So any payload it could be a reverse shell, but it could also be meterpreter, for instance. Okay. So what do we need to build a rub payload? We need a program. We take a DLL or a library of this program, and the first time you, you need to build a rub payload, uh, you, you think about it and you say, okay, I'm gonna disassemble the thing and uh, I'm gonna uh, grab for uh, write instructions. Okay, this way, mm, this might be feasible, but uh, it's quite difficult. If you need to write some extensive uh, thing, you will take a lot, a lot of time. So there is some tools, okay? There is RubMe, which is uh, search to bits, Linux only. There is uh, some things in the immunity debugger, such as fine gadgets, which builds a flat gadget.txt file, which is quite difficult to parse, and limited to Windows 32 bits application. There is the dead PV, fine that here. And of course, there is Mona. Uh, thanks to Peter. Or thanks, not sure, because I spent a terrible night because, uh, because of him, but. Uh, no. Okay, Mana is uh, it's really, really a big deal. Um, but seriously, uh, you're all working in security-related uh, domain, I guess. Or uh, if you're here, that's because you like, you really like security, I guess. Uh, how among you do security for money? Come on, uh, don't be afraid. Okay. Who among you do security for fun? Okay, if you make security for fun, you don't want a tool that does all the job for yourself. Okay, come on, it sucks. Okay, so I can say Skyrack, the f <laughs> fun of Skyrack is really higher than the fun from Mona. Okay, because it is a lot more work to build a payload with Skyrack than with Mona. I'm sorry for that. But <laughs> that's what it is. No, seriously, Mona is really, really a big deal. But there is different things uh, you, you can do with my, uh, with my tool, and um, I'm going to show you. So do we really, really need a tool? See, if we take uh, a library, uh, we can, uh, for instance, here the lib crypto, uh, and we look for the right instructions in this library, you can find about 6,000 right instructions in it, OK? 6,000 write instruction. 
Does it mean 6,000 gadgets? Yeah, no, maybe, I don't know. Of course, no. Okay, if we disassemble a few instructions before a red, okay, so here, uh, 64C, we can see this is the move R14 into RSP, the contrary, move RSP into R14. 64D, so just an instruction after, this is a different instruction, okay, this is move RSP into ESI. Two octet before, we get Again, another instruction, okay? So, since x86 has different uh, opcode sizes, if uh, you disassemble starting from one address, you may find uh, some instruction, and if you go one byte, two byte, three bytes later, you can find different instructions, okay? So, here, one red, 11 gadgets, okay? So, we are limited uh, in this graph to five instructions back. There is a uh, an arbitrary, uh, you can go back uh, as much instruction as you, as you want disassemble. Uh, but here, 11 gadgets are usable with one red, okay? There is, uh, on, uh, on your right, the GL26, which, uh, does not, uh, which is not useful, so I didn't count it. Okay, so we need a tool to, to pass and to find uh, some gadgets. Uh, in this library, there was in average 12.25 instructions per rate, with uh, this assembly of uh, five instruction uh, depth, okay? Which means uh, five instruction depth that if I take a rate, I will stop in this tree after five in, uh, instructions, okay? But you, you can go uh, as uh, far as you want. Uh, so, it's getting hard to grab and we do need a tool. So, I've been writing Skyrack. This is based on MitaSM. MitaSM, I don't know uh, how uh, English guys say it, but uh, it's written, so you should understand it. So, it allows to disassemble many kind of, uh, of binaries. Linux, ELF files, Windows PE files, and Mac OS, Mac OS flat FAT files. Um, I handle two CPUs, x86 and x86 64 bits. Um, no power PC, of course. So it's quite easy to import new architectures in this tool uh, as long as they are supported by MetaSM. There is only uh, a few uh, methods you need to, to override in order to get it to work with uh, different, uh, with different uh, architectures. Uh, for instance, uh, the base address of a section, the list of the section, and, um, and stuff like that. So, okay, uh, so it uh, also uses uh, Intel syntax for the representation, uh, for the graphical representation, graphical textual representation of, uh, of instructions. So, how do we build a gadget database? There is uh, an instruction which is SkyBuild, so you give uh, as an instruction the name of the library you want to, to build the gadgets for. So, all this uh, library will be a uh, parse and we store the result into a SQLite database, okay? Um, once uh, this is generated, uh, you have to think about your exploit, so how you will construct it, what you will do. For this, uh, I can't help you, this is your job, and this is why Skyrack is fun, I recall. Then you can build your exploit by looking for instructions you need. So there is an elaborated uh, search uh, function in Skyrack. Uh, the simple form is uh, to use, for instance, uh, a, row, uh, a row pattern, such as move EX. This will list all the gadgets uh, which contains move EX, but in a smart way. I will tell you more about that later. Then you have found the, uh, all the instructions you need, uh, you can put them in a file, okay? So you build your uh, exploit.txt file. This is a human readable uh, file, which only contains uh, at the beginning the address of your codes and then the, the list of the codes. And you can put uh, many different things in it, just to help the generating of exploit, but more uh, about it later. And once you have your uh, 
file built, you can generate your exploit. So there is Sky Generate, which will turn the human readable exploit.txt into a raw binary file. Once it's done, you can get a beer. You should be happy. Okay, so some use cases of uh, wrap payload building. Okay, here we have one rate. How many gadgets do we have? Come on, count. I'll wait. Six? Okay, six, that's the only answer? Come on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve, no? Okay, six, twelve. Only two, of course. You have a jump here. So you won't be able to execute the instruction before you will jump to somewhere to the un noun. Okay? Not interesting. There is only two instructions you can use. Okay, so if uh, a tool uh, gives you all this kind of gadget, this cannot be used. So in Skyrack, you can keep only the executable branches. Okay, there is an option which is preserve EIP, which will cut off the branches which are not executable in the gadget graph. Okay? So imagine uh, you're searching for another gadget and you, you need to add 8 to RX, okay? Maybe to uh, point it to the next uh, address. Mm, so you have uh, found the instruction of your dreams in a gadget, which does exactly that, add 8 to RX. But the gadget does not fit. Why? Because the add RX is followed by an instruction which makes RX to zero, okay? So it's not usable. So you can uh, tell Skyrack to, to skip the non-executable gadgets. So uh, if you use uh, the option preserve target, you will be able to skip all of those uh, registers that modify the uh, register you're looking for. Okay, so here we are looking for uh, an instruction which appears on EAX, and if we use preserve target, all the branches that modify EAX will be cut and won't be shown to you. And you can uh, skip also gadgets that only spe modify a specific register if you really need it for your previous gadgets or for uh, some reason, I don't know. And uh, you can just use preserve and uh, an arbitrary register. Okay, so um, if you need uh, to preserve the ESI register, you may find it difficult to find such instructions, such as move ESI into EX or rechange EX and ESI, depending on the, on the binary file you are passing. So you need the following, push ESC, pop reg, okay? Um, this is sequence of instruction which is quite difficult to, to search for if you're in a flat gadget file. So uh, you can combine uh, the instruction you need to search by pushing multiple times the dash A option. Okay, so here dash A pop ESI, dash A push will return all the gadgets which contain the push pop ESI instruction and the push instruction. Then you can search for specific registers. For instance, uh, if you need to add a specific value to array, so if you have to perform operations between LBX and LCX. And when you build the rub gadgets, you will uh, quickly realize that you often need uh, to do a lot of work with registers because you don't know often where uh, pointers, memory pointers are uh, to, if it is valid address or not. So you, you the most reli reliable thing is to use to the um, to the register. In addition, these registers um, are really uh, the most common uh, in, uh, in the instructions you'll find. So it is really, really useful to be able to filter them. So if you want to search for the move instruction and you search for the destination with the option regs, it will show you all the move instruction which appears on registers. Okay, so on if you're in a 32-bit uh, processor, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, and, uh, and that's it. You can also search for a specific register with a dash D error X. Okay, Skyrack also allows you to convert payloads. So there is a Sky Convert tool uh, which uh, helps you to convert a payload written for a specific library to a payload for another library. In this way, it's really easy to convert an exploit. 
For instance, if you use two libraries, you've been writing an exploit for libssl 98 b uh, you will find that your exploit does not work longer on the open uh, SSL 98 c because there is some differences in the binary and so the gadget addresses are completely different. Uh, so if you're lucky, uh, you may also port your exploit to a completely different lib because uh, some instructions are somehow common and uh, can be found in different libs. But it's not as flexible as Mona and uh, you will uh, need uh, to build your payload in a, in a specific way to get this to work. Okay? Uh, so the use uh, for this uh, tool is a uh, sky convert and you take as an argument you exploit the txt file. The two uh, Database built by uh, Skyrack, which contains the gadgets, and the output will be the new uh, exploit.txt file. So once uh, you have built your uh, payload, you generate indeed the payload. So uh, uh, this takes, this is Sky Generate, you take an argument, the exploit.txt file, and you construct a raw binary file. Uh, so this command is just enough to build uh, the exploit. Uh, so, if you are exploiting local software, um, Sky Generate allows you to, to pass an offset, which may be useful to brute force local uh, exploit or remote exploit, which uh, can be uh, triggered multiple times. And this way, you will be able to uh, brute force some uh, offset. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, a Windows SLR, you, you may uh, find, uh, find it useful. So uh, another uh, good point is that you can script it easily. So it is Ruby. Uh, this example is the in, in uh, IRB. It's the interactive Ruby shell. For instance, here I just launch Sky uh, IRB. I require one file from Sky Rack, and I can load a database into the the IRB, and then I can uh, list one specific gadget, I can search for uh, different uh, gadgets and stuff like that. Everything is, uh, is highly callable from the, from the Ruby interpreter or from uh, any of your scripts. Okay, so next uh, step is the payload generation. So here we will be really building the, the payload. So one of the typical warp scheme you, you may use is, for instance, to use a combination of virtual lock, memcopy, and jump ex. This will uh, allow you to, uh, to allocate some specific memory and uh, to copy your shell code in it and to jump to it. How can we do that? So uh, we need to prepare the stack with the arguments of the virtual alloc function. So uh, it takes destination, size, allocation type, and the protection of the memory you're trying to allocate. Next step is to craft the memcopy argument, because memcopy needs the destination buffer and the source buffer. And uh, when we are writing the exploit, we are not aware of any of these, uh, of these arguments. Of course, you need the size, and at the top of the, at the bottom of the stack, we will put the, the shell code. So uh, the difficulty here is the arguments from mcopy. So the following arguments are unknown when you write the payload. You don't know the destination buffer, and you don't know the source buffer. Hence, we need uh, to find the, the memory where the memory has been allocated by virtual alloc. Uh, so this is virtual alloc return value. This is the same thing for malloc. We need to find the shellcode address, which we know is at the, at the bottom of the stack. Uh, since we are writing the payload, we, we know the, the distance of the payload from ESP. Okay, this is uh, something we can decide by uh, putting in lower on the stack or upper on the stack, we decide. And finally, we need to write these computed instructions, these computed values, on specific places on the stack. Okay? Why specific places? Because, of course, we need to write it exactly here and here. If we write it lower, we will uh, smash the, the size. Upper, we will smash the, the return value of, uh, of mcopy. So we, we need to be really precise in, uh, in this case. Uh, so 
one assumption for this uh, demo is that the stack grows up, that we don't care about uh, ISLR or that we are performing brute force, and that we control EIP. Okay? We don't care about stack protection, SCHOP. We imagine that you already gain uh, EIP. Okay? And the payload can contain null bytes, which is a requirement in 64-byte ROP. 64-bit ROP exploitation because uh, memory addresses are full of null bytes. Okay, so we prepare the virtual alloc call. That's the easy part, since uh, all of its arguments are uh, constants. Okay, so we prepare uh, the arguments. Okay, no problem. Uh, what happens when virtual alloc will returns? It will put ESP at this place. So in EIP will receive the, the saved address, okay? The saved address, which is indicated here. Uh, next step, uh, if we put a red address in the saved address, it will just pop the top of your stack into EIP, and uh, so we will uh, be able to execute uh, the uh, address we have found where the arrow is pointing here. So uh, we need to find a red. That's really easy. You just search for a red. Here, we found a red. OK, good. Uh, we need then to craft the mem copy arguments. So we need to save EAX. Why? Because EAX is the return value from virtual alloc, and then it contains the memory which has been allocated. OK? So we uh, need to say EAX, we need to compute the memory arguments address. Okay, so this is this address because the arguments uh, we need to write are uh, pointed to by this uh, address. Uh, we need to copy the saved EAX to this address. Then we need to increment this address in order to get it to point to the second argument. Then we need to compute the shellcode address, which is the address of this part. And we need to write the source address, the address of the, of the shellcode into uh, arg plus four, okay? Uh, then we will be able to call memcopy. And if uh, uh, we use a specific instruction here, we will be able to jump to the shellcode. Okay, so how do we craft the memcopy arguments? To save EAX, it's easy. You can uh, just use the HL instruction, with, uh, which operates on e which can operate on EAX. So with this uh, simple search uh, command, you will find this instruction. Okay, so we put in our uh, in our uh, rub chain this instruction, this uh, address. I mean, then we need to compute the même copy arguments. Uh, what is the address of the shellcode? This is an incremented value of ESP. Okay, this is ESP minus uh, all the plus all the uh, the wrap uh, exploit we are building. Okay, if you recall, we are building uh, this uh, wrap uh, chain, and the shellcode is here. So we need ESP plus uh, many many bytes in order to to get here. So we can uh, search for uh, interesting add variables, and we will mostly find add on which appears on EAX. Okay, so uh, that's good. We will uh, use this uh, this value, but for this we need to push ESP into EAX. Okay, um, so we need to copy ESP into EAX. We won't find no move. E a ESP into uh, EAX, uh, so uh, we have uh, we will have to use the stack. Okay, so if we search for instruction combining push and pop, uh, we will find this one. So key which performs push ESP pop ESI. What does it do? It just transfers the content of ESP into ESI. Then, uh, if we look for move uh, specific move instruction, we will find an instruction which move ESI into EAX. So in this way, we have uh, uh, right now ESP into EAX. Of course, if we can't write directly this uh, gadget instruction, we need uh, to put 
some uh, junk, be some padding be between the instructions, since there is some um, parasite pop, uh, which will uh, decrease the, the stack. In fact, increase the ESP value. OK, so once uh, we have uh, done that, we can write all of it in our, uh, in our uh, shellcode. And if you recall, at this line, we have a backup of EAX into uh, the last line of the, of the rope uh, payload, I mean. We have a backup of uh, EAX into EDX, OK? And we have uh, in EAX the value of ESP incremented of 40 bytes. Uh, OK, so right now we need to write to uh, the address pointed to by EAX. Uh, so we search for simple uh, instruction which uh, use a pointer uh, into EAX. So we found just the one we need. Uh, since EDX holds our EAX backup, uh, this is enough to craft the memcopy first argument. OK, so let's add this line to our uh, rub shell code. Uh, to wrap payload. And then we need uh, to add 4 to EAX to point it to the next memcopy argument. But we don't have no add EDX4 instruction. But if we look for our instructions that open on EAX, we will find an instruction which does to ink EAX. Okay, so if we combine this gadget twice, we will indeed add 4 to EAX. Okay, so we are almost done. Uh, we have incremented uh, save DSP to get it to point to shellcode base at the air, and then we pop enough bytes from the stack to get to the memcopy address. The memcopy return value should be our uh, copied shellcode address, and luckily, uh, just like it's designed for rob building, memcopy returns the address of the written area. Okay, so you just need a to jump to EAX after you've been executing memcopy, and you will jump to your shellcode. Okay, so uh, there is a different another tool in uh, Skyrack, which uh, was just uh, three lines longer writing after I've been writing the other. So I write it, and it allows you to search for a specific instruction. In fact, it uh, takes the instruction you, you give it, it just compiles it, and it looks into, uh, into the binaries for this instruction. It's useful, for instance, if you search syscalls, because uh, I'm not aware of any uh, syscall search uh, instruction in MTISM, or you already need to compute the, the upcode of syscalls. Anyway, it's just a bit uh, faster. <laughs> that, that's it. And uh, so we find the offset of a jump EX in our library. And then we can add it to our uh, payload. So the full patch, the full exploit can be written in a, in a file. Uh, in order for the file to be uh, handled by uh, Sky Generate, I just uh, add a few uh, syntax uh, things. If you have a, uh, I don't know the English one for this character. If you have a point d'exclamation, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, you, the, you can put Ruby code just after it, and it will be executed. Okay. Uh, for instance, if it returns a string, uh, the string will be included in the uh, in the shell code. And then you can put all of your uh, instruction, and uh, uh, so give this file to Sky Generate. Um, and there is also a comments, of course, uh, in order to in order to have uh, clear uh, exploit files. So this will allow to write comprehensible and portable exploit files, uh, which are often more clear than uh, some uh, ROP exploits you can find on the internet, which are uh, quite difficult to understand. Uh, so you can generate uh, the payload, uh, Sky generate your exploit, you pipe the output in some binary file, uh, and you can run it. So I'm going to show you a little demonstration for, uh, for this. Okay, just uh, keep this away. Uh, so here we are uh, in uh, Olidebeje, and uh, we are just 
at uh, the red instruction of the vulnerable function. Okay, so uh, you can uh, recall the the exploitation we've been writing. The first thing will be to jump to virtual alloc. Okay, so. Uh, the next instruction will be a jump into uh, fin, the next instruction executed will be virtual alloc. Okay, so here we are in virtual alloc. Uh, we need to put a breakpoint at the end of virtual alloc because we don't care about the internals. So here we are just uh, before virtual alloc returns. Okay, remember what I did? We just put a ret for the uh, instruction executed after the return of virtual alloc. So the ret will be executed. Up, here it comes. <coughs> and we can see we have uh, the, we have uh, indeed crafted the stack with virtual alloc uh, arguments. <coughs> Okay, so the return. Um, here we can see we have exchange EX DX, which is our backup for EX. We'll return. Next gadget, this is our way to, to, to save or to transfer ESP into EX. So remember, we push it on the stack, we pop it into ESI. That's it. We return. Then we move ESI into EX. There is a pop, so you can see on the on the stack uh, the the padding. We return. Uh, okay. On next instruction, we add forty to EX. We return. We can thread. Uh, we move EDX into the world pointed to by EX. Okay. We ink EX twice, four times, in order to get it to point to the next address. And the end of the execution is the crafting of the second argument of uh, copy, which I didn't. Uh, detailed in my uh, in my slides okay so this uh, this way we've been able to uh, to follow the execution of the of the raw payload this is something quite nice to to see uh, the 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 following execution of the of the gadgets in a, in a debugger okay so here we're done uh, i'm going to show you uh, another uh, another video which will uh, only uh, run the exploit in uh, in real time in uh, not in a debugger okay so on the um, on the left we have a linux machine with metasploit on the right we have a windows machine and uh, all i've been doing is uh, that uh, i run the the exploit and so here we have been able to uh, indeed uh, use a metapreter into metasploit okay so we indeed uh, gain uh, <laughs> execution with it. Okay, so that's it for uh, for this tool. Uh, if you have any question, I'm, uh, I'm available. And this tool will be made uh, available. Uh, I hope it would be today, but uh, it should be uh, tomorrow since the guys handling the website uh, at work uh, seems to have a lot of work today. So uh, maybe uh, beginning of the next week, but it is pushed and uh, it does not depend on me. Will be uh, available very soon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you said you can uh, port some uh, raw payload from one library to another one. Uh, do you have a way to choose a raw payload which is uh, compatible with two different versions of the same library, or is is there a way to script this kind of uh, research? Uh, indeed, to convert the payload, you you need to generate the the database of the gadget for the second library. Okay, so 
if you have one wrap payload, it will uh, only look for the equivalent instructions in the second library. Uh, so there is no uh, difficulty to, to do that. Um, but there is no need for scripting since it's only uh, two, two, two commands to, well, of course you may script it, but uh, it's only two commands uh, you need to, to generate the payload for a second uh, library. Did I answer to your question? Okay. Any other question? Can see nothing with this slide. Okay, well, thank you very much.